Good morning. Good morning. I'm delighted to welcome you all at the Johns Hopkins Carey Business School Leaders and Legend for January 2011. As you know, each month we bring forth another leader to engage the Baltimore business community in a discussion of what is important and relevant in the business world. Today, I'm delighted to welcome Paula A. Kerger, a Baltimore native. She's the president and CEO of PBS. Paula has led PBS since 2006, and during her tenure, she has overseen the development of numerous award-winning programs and documentaries, as well as expanding the PBS presence on the internet. Paula is also president of the PBS Foundation, which raises public sector funding for the network. As you may know, PBS is, a sec is the largest non-commercial media organization in the United States and has over 350 member stations broadcasting its programming around the country. <coughs> Monthly, nearly 115 million people watch PBS. During the 2009-10 television season, PBS received 31 Emmys, including six for news and documentary programming and two for business and financial programming. Of course, PBS is also well known for its arts and children's programs. The network continues to broaden global access to these programs through innovative partnership with cable, online, and other platforms. At PBS, they're fond of saying that they, are, they measure success by the number of lives they touch. At Cary Business School, we proclaim that we touch business with humanity in mind. Given the synergies of our missions, I'm especially delighted to welcome today's speaker, Paula A. Kerger. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome, Paula. Um, thank you. It's uh, really wonderful to, uh, to be here today and to be in this beautiful space and to watch the, uh, the sun rise in my uh, hometown of uh, Baltimore. Um, and it's funny, standing here and really looking at the harbor, I think of how much the city has, has really transformed uh, since uh, I was a child. And it's very exciting. And I um, enjoy coming back and visiting whenever I can. Um, I, um, was asked to come this morning and talk a little bit about the future of public broadcasting. Uh, but before I do, uh, perhaps you'd allow me to uh, look back for a few minutes at the era of my childhood. I was too young to remember JFK's inauguration speech on TV. Uh, but his words uh, still resonate today when he told all Americans to ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. It was also 50 years ago that Newton Minow uh, made an historic speech when he began his term as Kennedy's first chairman of the FCC. Uh, speaking to the National Association of Broadcasters, he famously said, when television is good, nothing, not the theater, not the magazines or newspapers, nothing is better. But when television is bad, nothing is worse. He invited the members of the NAB, and these were all people in the broadcasting industry, to each sit down in front of their television sets when their stations go on the air, and to stay there for a day without a book, without a magazine, or a newspaper to distract you. He encouraged them to keep their eyes glued to the set until the station signed off the air. That was in the era when stations would sign off the air at night. And what he said then is, I can assure you that what you will observe is a vast wasteland. These words captured the zeitgeist and became a powerful clarion call for changes in the broadcasting industry. Now, when I reread his speech, I was struck not by his characterizations of the ills of television, many of which unfortunately still hold true today, but instead I was struck by the emphasis on public interest and the responsibility that he placed on broadcasters to engage and educate the American public. Broadcasting, he says, possesses the most powerful voice in America. It has an inescapable duty to make the voice ring with intelligence and with leadership. Now, in this day and age, with so much focus on the bottom line of media companies, we've forgotten that our airwaves and now our digital spectrum actually belong to the American people. 
As Minow said, the people own the air. He warned broadcasters that it is not enough to cater to the nation's whims. We must also serve the nation's needs. He challenged broadcasters to put the people's airways to the service of the people and the cause of freedom. You must help prepare a generation for great decisions. You must help a great nation fulfill its future. Now, Minow was speaking in the days before there was YouTube and Hulu and the iPad. And he was speaking before there was a dedicated space for educational television, before there was PBS. But I think that his diagnosis still holds true today. The power and responsibility that are given to the media are given in trust by the American people. And because of that, I think we all must use the power to do more than simply entertain. We must also educate, illuminate, and inspire. Now, when PBS was founded, our challenge was to demonstrate that Minow's vision could be fulfilled and that television could indeed do those things. It could educate, it could illuminate, it could inspire. And I think we've proven that, and that's what the clip that I brought along to share with you at the beginning of this breakfast hoped to do, is to show a little bit of the legacy of this organization that has been part of the American culture for more than 40 years, from Sesame Street to NewsHour to Nova. We've shown that TV can be more than just mindless entertainment, or as my father used to refer to it, the boob tube. Now, um, the uh, dean referred to our viewership. Actually, in this past year, our viewership has exceeded 117 million viewers each month. Ratings for P PBS uh, during this last season, 2009-2010, were up 18% from the prior year, 18%. Together, PBS and our local stations reach more viewers in prime time than HBO, CNN, Discovery, History, and almost every other major cable channel. Our children's lineup is also extraordinarily strong. Among mothers of young children, PBS has seven of the top ten programs in the last recorded month, which was November. And PBS.org was number 19 in video streams among all video sites in, the, in that same month. Our preschool video player, which we launched just a year ago, averages 88 million video streams a month. And so this essentially makes PBS the number one destination for children online. Our PBS for iPad, which was uh, announced on October 25th, reached number one in the iTunes store within the first 24 hours of its release. So from where I stand, there are lots of ways that we can look at the success of public broadcasting and specifically the reach of how we're connecting to the public. But there's one statistic that I'm the, the most proudest of and one measure of success that for me really captures what I hope my organization is able to achieve. And that's a Roper poll that's done each year. And for the last seven years, the seven years the poll has been, um, has been uh, conducted, Americans have named PBS the most educational media brand for children, and the most unbiased news source, and most significantly, again for the seventh consecutive year, the most trusted public institution. And I might add, the second best use of federal taxpayers, second only to our national defense. The trust forged by more than four decades of public service, I think represents a very special bond between PBS and the American public, but I think it also represents something else, a very special obligation. It also represents a call to action. And so today, the challenge before PBS is, can we recreate ourselves for the digital age and use media to help every American of every age and from every walk of life reach their potential? Can we help America come together and find common ground that is so essential to solve our greatest problems? And can we rise to the occasion, even in this time of living in resources, to empower every citizen to accomplish their own potential, to, in essence, be more. Can we be more at PBS? I think we can. In fact, I know we can. But if we're to meet this challenge, then we have to think anew about it, what's, what it means to be public media. We have to summon the courage to let go of old conventions and traditions and embrace new strategies, new methods, and new approaches. And so this morning, I thought I would use this opportunity to talk to you a little bit about how we have our plans underway to uh, rise to those challenges. We're beginning by building on core strengths, and this, of course, is what every business in America attempts to do. And for us, it means to reimagine children's media, 
using every platform at our disposal to put children first and help them to expand their minds and broaden their horizons. It means to reimagine journalism and throw open the doors to public media, welcoming new voices, new perspectives, and new partners, and to help Americans re-engage with the arts and culture by ensuring that every American, no matter what your economic means or where you live, you have access to the greatest arts that are created in this country. I think this is in some ways also mirrors the agenda for our nation, which is designed to maximum, maximize our strengths as a nation so that we can help move forward and ensure our collective success. Above all, I think what I'm trying to describe is what is um, our vision for public media, what I know we can be, and how I believe we need to get there. So let me begin with the first item, which is the reimagining of children's media. Now, research shows that the most critical moments in a child's life are those years before the age of five. This is when children learn how to learn. And it's when their emotional, educational, and social skills really begin to take shape. Research shows that 75% of all four-year-olds attend some kind of preschool program, whether it's Head Start or, or Pre-K or um, um, some sort of preschool. And that's great. But what it means is that a quarter of children growing up in this country are being left out. We all know the, quality, the benefit of a high quality preschool education. Every childhood education really does give children a head start in life. But the flip side is also true. Research clearly shows that children that start behind stay behind. Specifically, young children who never enter pre-K are more likely to be placed in special ed classes, more likely to become involved with juvenile crime, and more likely to drop out of high school. And that's why we are so focused within public television across the country at our stations in making sure that we're an invaluable resource for children. We're accessible in almost every home in this country. There may not be a computer in every household, but there is certainly a television set. So that there is no government agency or social service organization that has the reach that we do. We are in people's homes. We are part of people's lives. And so that gives us a special responsibility, I believe, to offer high quality educational content for children, particularly on television, and especially for those who'll never see the inside of a pre-K classroom. There's a statistic that I share with um, organizations as I speak across the country that when I heard a few years ago was so stunning to me um, that on many mornings when, and we all have these days when we come into the office and we think, oh, another day. Um, but then you always have that reminder of what it is that keeps firing you forward. And for me, it's this statistic about kids. And that is in the state of California, the state anticipates and plans the number of prison beds they will need based on third grade reading scores. So if that doesn't remind you why it is so important to stay focused on young children and to give them every opportunity that we can to help them succeed and develop literacy skills and to develop the skills that they'll need to succeed in life. I don't know what else I can tell you to, to try to, uh, to uh, persuade you. It's a responsibility that Maryland Public Television here has embraced with tremendous enterprise and enthusiasm. Last year, MPT introduced the PBS Kids Island Learning Site at local Head Start centers. One of the teachers began using the site with her students and discovered immediately how helpful it is in encouraging their children to, particularly in the area of language and, and speech. The city of Baltimore has now embarked on a pilot to use PBS Kids Island throughout the city to help close the achievement gap. At PBS, we're working to help our stations serve their community's early childhood needs by building on the success of what we started on television 40 years ago with then what seemed like a radical idea for children's television, Sesame Street. And this fall, we have uh, brought forward yet another new program, Cat in the Hat knows a lot about that, which is not only a beloved children's literature uh, character, but is also a character designed to help children develop basic skills in science. Um, and it's a challenge as you work on children's programming because you need to do two things. You need to from our perspective, we're looking to build in the kind of rich co um, content that I'm describing. But the other thing that you need to do when you're building children's programming is they got to be fun. Because believe it or not, even the smallest children 
can work this computer, and they can certainly work a remote. And so if you're w wanting to engage children, you've got to make sure that the children come to watch the programming and stay with you and aren't flipping the channel to find SpongeBob. So um, we put a lot of effort into not only thinking about the academic rigor of the programs that we develop, but also creating characters that are beloved, that draw children in, and make them want to engage with our work. And we've been pretty successful. And this year, in particular, um, we have four of the top 10 children's programs on television for children two to five. And um, in November, we did a special uh, with Curious George, Follow That Monkey, which um, brought in a, um, which is a, by television standards now, a huge rating of 7.3 for kids two to five. So um, we are really excited about the educational value of the work we're doing, but we're also truly excited about the fact that we're able to engage kids around the work that we're doing. Probably as important as, um, as anything, though, is really understanding how the content that we develop really t engages children's minds. And so we do a lot of research to, um, to not only um, um, help us build the programs that we create, but also to demonstrate that we are truly meeting the, moving the needle in the education value of the programs that uh, we put on our air. Uh, we did recent research with Sesame Street, Between the Lions, and Super Y, and Word World, which are four programs that are in our literacy block for little kids. And we saw amazing gains. A University of Pennsylvania study showed that children increased early literacy skills by 46% by watching as few as two episodes of Super Y. Um, we know that we have material that can touch children and that can make a difference. And I think that that's why so many parents also recognize the value that we um, create. And so um, um, we're proud that we're able to bring our work to so many parents, but we're also proud that we're recognized in our own industry. And for the 13th consecutive year, you mentioned some of our Emmys. Uh, we have won more daytime Emmy awards than any children's programming on any broadcasting or cable network. And for those that play Trivial Pursuit, the television show that has won more Emmys than any television program in history is Sesame Street. Um, this fall, we announced we'll continue to partner with the Department of Education and expand our work in early childhood literacy and math to make sure that um, kids age two to eight develop um, additional math and, and the STEM skills of science, technology, um, engineering, and math. We're doing this across multiple platforms. I've talked a lot about television, but we understand that technology right now offers us such tremendous tools. They offer all of us tools for us to be connected and for us to do our business better. But for children, they offer rich educational resources. Um, as I mentioned, we have a robust website with video. Uh, we are offering material on both the iPhone and the iPad. Um, and um, these apps, I'm not, I don't want to suggest that we're building apps to sell iPhones and iPads to young children. They are designed for you. <coughs> Uh, and they are designed for those moments when, um, and you've all had them, I'm sure, with a child or a grandchild or a niece or nephew that as you're going through the grocery store and they are pulling every bloody thing off the shelf, um, that you can pull up uh, one of our apps on your iPhone and hand the phone to your child. Um, and it becomes a learning moment. And the work that we're doing there is important, not just for those opportunities, but we also recognize that for many people, the iPhone or some version of a smartphone actually will be their computing device. Uh, they won't have a laptop or a um, uh, uh, mainframe computer in their homes. They're going to have the iPhone or a smartphone. And so we want to begin to develop content, developing content that is going to reach lots of children. And so we've been doing that, uh, a lot of research on that. Uh, our Martha Speak series, which was one of the early iPhone apps that we developed. Um, uh, in some testing, uh, demonstrated improving vocabulary by 30%. So we're trying to think about the internet. We're trying to think about uh, in, uh, mobile devices to do um, for those devices what we were able to accomplish with television, which is to use them not just as, as tools that connect us, but also as tools that uh, for teaching and learning. 
So in other words, to put it in the parlance of our times, if you want to help your children achieve their full potential, or there's an app for that too. And that's very much about what our vision is for media. Uh, we want to use public media to use every platform at our disposal. Uh, for children and for adults, I think it's tremendously important that um, as we continue our work, and for us the bottom line is we treat children like, um, um, like citizens, not many consumers. And we want to give them a rich experience that is commercial free and that is educational and that really helps them on the path of their life. Um, of course, education is not the only thing that we do at public television. Uh, one of the things that we're particularly focused on right now is the crisis in journalism. And that begins with newspapers, which um, remain the largest source of reportorial, report, should have had more coffee, journalism in America. <clears throat> Yet since 2000, the newspaper industry has lost 30% of its reporting and editing capabilities. Think about that for a minute. That means there are a third fewer reporters covering school boards, town councils, and other vital local institutions, as well as covering uh, national and international stories. The broadcast networks have cut their news divisions in half since the 80s. And since the Great Recession, local new, uh, TV newsrooms have laid off hundreds of journalists. All of these numbers bring to mind the words of uh, Jefferson, who said, our liberty cannot be guarded but by the freedom of the press. And so the thing to keep in mind is that even though journalism's reporting base is shrinking, opinion-oriented journalism is growing. So we just saw over this past weekend with the um, uh, blow up with uh, Keith Oberman. Talk radio, cable television, the blogosphere, each seems to grow louder, rowdier, and more hyperpartisan by the day. I'm particularly concerned about the blurring between news and point of view. I think that um, this has great consequences for us as a society. And so it's perhaps no wonder that 40, um, excuse me, that 70% of Americans feel that most news sources are biased in their coverage. Another 70% feel overwhelmed by the amount of news that they see, hear, or read. And in these days where the issues are so profoundly complex, I think we are doing ourselves and our country a great disservice if we don't do something to try to help um, create a journalistic system that in fact meets the needs of all of our Americans. And that's why for us in public television, journalism is very high. In fact, it's the second item on our priority list. Because I think as a nation, we can't come together to confront our problems if we don't have reliable, accurate information not opinions, and not others' uh, views, but we're able to form our own based on news, real news. And that's why I think that journalism just doesn't need a rescue, it needs a reinvention. I mean, having grown up at a time when Walter Cronkite really brought us all together around an electronic hearth, I'm not suggesting that we need to return back to that place. But I think we do need to pay attention to the fact that we face many critical issues as a country, and we need to make sure that all citizens are better informed about the issues of the day. Our local PBS stations are leading the way in this effort. In um, St. Louis, for example, our station there has partnered with the St. Louis Beacon, which is an online nonprofit newspaper that operates out of the station's newsroom. This, was, um, this um, organization was created out of journalists that left the newspaper and then created this online source. They are doing a couple things that I think are really interesting. One is they're focused on professional journalism. But the second thing that they're doing is they're helping to empower their viewers to become citizen journalists and to train them in the art of digital storytelling and editing and reporting. Now, I know for some that's a controversial um, name, citizen journalist. What does that mean? I don't for a moment suggests that citizen journalists can replace professional journalists. But I think there is an important role for an engaged citizenry and a empowered um, group of professional journalists in this country. And I think if we're able to accomplish that, I think that we can do a lot in, 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 in making sure that we are in a country that is informed um, about what is, it is that is most important not about stories of Lindsay Lohan and Britney Spears, the things that don't really matter. Um, and so this is really also driving um, our decisions at the national level. 
Uh, we have, over the course of the last two years, launched a news and public affairs initiative that's really all about reaffirming our commitment to professional journalism and looking for ways that we can also welcome new voices into public media. Um, the centerpiece of that is the work that we've been doing around the news hour. And if you're a news hour viewer or you use the news hour online, then you know that we've made some significant changes over the past year. We kept the core of the program intact, but we have been focusing on making sure that the kind of immediacy of the reporting that had been done through the online news hour comes together with the broadcast. Uh, we've hari um, hired some new journalists, including Harry Srivanasan, who ironically we brought over from commercial media, who was doing an amazing job at helping us build our work both online as well as on air and connecting the dots. Obviously, the centerpiece of our work um, in investigative journalism is Frontline. We've, ex we've expanded the footprint of Frontline so that it's on now uh, throughout the entire year. And, uh, and they continue to do uh, the kind of reporting and serving as a fearless monitor of our nation's most powerful people and institutions. We've also formed new partnerships with organizations that are emerging in the new media space. ProPublica is probably the best example of that, which is the Pulitzer Prize winning nonprofit news gathering organization that is working with now a lot of other journalistic organizations, including the New York Times as, as well as us. So taken together, <clears throat> we are looking to <clears throat> create a place on public television that is an independent voice and that really does bring together opportunities for other people that are working in the public media space to be part of public television and the reporting that we're doing together. And as we work to engage citizens in civic life, um, we are also committed to engaging um, citizens in the arts and culture. Consider this, between 2007 and 2008, 35% of Americans went at least once to an art gallery, a ballet, a classical music concert, a jazz performance, or a play or musical. And that figure comes from a nationwide survey that's conducted by the NEA every couple years. Now, that 35% participation rate is actually a little lower than, um, than the high point, which was in 1982. But here's something that's interesting. The public's participation in the arts has slipped about 4% over the last 25 years. Contrast that to the public's participation and, and attendance at movies, which has fallen twice as fast, or the percentage of adults who attend sporting events, which has actually fallen four times as fast. Now, I, for one, am not that surprised, because I know from my own personal experiences growing up here, and Baltimore has such a rich, rich cultural history, when you think of the symphony, when you think of center stage, when you think of, of the um, Baltimore Museum of Art and Walter's Art Gallery. but. Um, uh, and I often have found for myself that if I have a lot on my mind, if I'm really wrestling with issues, uh, particularly at work, sometimes just going into a, a, a I, I love jazz, going into a jazz club at night and just sitting in the room and just, and just letting the music you know, sort of come through me, I walk out feeling completely different. I, I, I went to uh, Arena Stage on Friday night, and this is a, a little bit of a plug, and, uh, and saw Anna DeVere Smith's amazing play, Let Me Down Easy. And that play does everything that theater and art should accomplish. It was provocative. It was inspiring. It was, at times, maddening. And that is what art, in its, in its best form, accomplishes for all of us. And so uh, what we're hoping to do in, in public television, and now I'll tell you we're actually taping the program so you can watch it if you don't get to arena stage, um, is that we want to give every American the opportunity to have those experiences. Um, and, and all kinds of art. I'm not just talking about what, when, when one thinks of the art, I'm not talking about just paintings hanging on a wall. I'm talking about multimedia art and experimental art and slam poetry. It's all part of our cultural heritage. And I think what we're hoping to do through um, our renewed commitment to expanding our work in the arts is to strengthen the work that we're doing on television and to use new platforms to help Americans engage in the arts. Now, in television, if you look and you sort of flip through your dials, see, this, this dates me. I still talk about flipping through the dials. I know you're actually with the remote flipping through the dials. Anyway, when you flip through the dials, you know that, um, that there are a few 
wonderful examples of arts programming on television. There's, there's Glee, there's American Idol, there's Dancing with the Stars, and there's actually not much else. You know, I grew up at a time when um, the Ed Sullivan Show had the opera singer alongside Popo Gigio, alongside the Beatles. And uh, that doesn't really exist anymore. And so for us, uh, we are really doubled down our efforts. A lot of cable organizations have tried to, to create a service that is based on arts programming. Bravo started out that way and actually had a fairly heroic run at doing arts programming. But they've shifted as they found other programs that um, that work better for them as a, as a, as a cable organization. A&E, most people forget that A&E stands for arts and entertainment. I know that when you watch A&E, you can't reconcile that with CSI, but that's actually how they started out. That's why they go by A&E now. But it's, it's, it's just, it's not, and that's not a um, criticism of them. It's just they're in a different business than we are. And when you set out with your work, to deliver um, against a bottom line to shareholders, you will make different decisions. Our shareholders aren't on Wall Street, they're on Main Street. And so when we start out our work, obviously I am running a, a organization that is committed to running um, uh, in the in, in, um, break even. Uh, but for us, we have not a bottom line, but a double bottom line. So we want to make sure that we're um, running the most efficient organization that we can, but we're also running an organization that has yet another deliverable, and that is to fulfill our mission. And so as we look at our work in the arts, we're really looking at opportunities to, um, to bring um, really great work um, to all Americans. I have been in this job for five years, and when I first came to PBS, I <clears throat> traveled a lot and I visited many of our stations across the country. And the one thing that struck me as I traveled around the country, um, I always like to joke, I feel, sort of always felt like a political candidate except the election never would happen. But, but I saw really such amazing work that was happening in communities across the country, but particularly in the arts. There's just such extraordinary um, uh, organizations that are just doing amazing work and not enough people know about it. And so what we're trying to do with our arts initiative is to really bring those stories uh, to the full American public. We also want people to feel inspired to create their own work. And that's part of what I think makes, you know, artistic expression is part of what makes us human, that desire to be creative. And so what we're hoping to do <clears throat> with our arts initiative is not just have great television, but through our web give people an opportunity to participate and to share some of their own work, to interact with artists. It's really, I think this is a moment when clearly the technology is, um, is really catching up with our mission. And that, for me, is very excited. Now, of course, we also have a deep commitment to history and to documentaries. You know, NOVA and American Experience and Ken Burns are very much an integral part of public media. They help us to really help connect Americans together I think of our role as being very much America's storyteller. And as we look at the challenges for the future, I think it does help to remember the past. And that's a, a deep commitment of what we are doing. But, um, but I think that as we look at all of our work together, there is a, a great role for us moving forward if, in fact, we can bring the resources together. Now, I'm not going to give a fundraising pitch, although I know you are our business leaders. Um, I know you're already supporting Maryland Public Television, I'm assuming that. But we're able to do the work we do because we are, in fact, a very powerful public-private partnership. We get 15% of our funding from the federal government, that's one five. And then we leverage that with money that we raise uh, through corporate sponsorship, through foundations, but most importantly from viewers like you. Thank you. More than 50% of the money that we bring into public television comes from individual contributions, people that sit down at their kitchen tables and write a check each and every year. And if you put all of our, uh, our uh, public television stations together, we are the largest membership organization of, of any arts and cultural organization in the country. We have uh, millions of Americans who believe that it is important to use the power of media to do something else besides just entertain. That it has, in fact, the opportunity to have a higher purpose. And so, um, and so this is my slight little pitch before I move into the uh, question and answer period. Um, 
Our public television system was created because people felt that it was important. When public television came on the air in this country, um, it came on the air because I will now refer to another FCC commissioner. I talked about Newton Minow at the beginning of my speech. That was a, the first female FCC commissioner, a woman by the name of Freda Hennock. And she watched the television industry begin to evolve. And she saw that it was a very powerful, potentially very powerful medium. And all, pub all television at that time was commercial television. And she thought that there should be a piece of spectrum that was set aside that could be used for educational purposes. And she worked for a number of years to petition. Eventually, the FCC agreed. And they set aside 10% of the spectrum that could be used for education. There was no money. It was just the spectrum. And any community organization could come together and petition to get a license to put it on the air for their communities. The very first public television stations were affiliated with universities because they had the infrastructure and they were often built as adjuncts to their journalism departments and so forth. And so they were the first to come on the air. And then as time went by, Maryland was created by the state and it was viewed as a uh, real vehicle to be a classroom of the air that could bring great teachers to every part of the state. Some stations, my station, my old station in New York, WNET, was created when a commercial station went belly up. The commercial broadcasters came together, in part altruism, in part keeping a competitor out of the marketplace, to come together to give the spectrum to the people of New York to create a television station that became WNET. So there are lots of different models of how public television came into be in each community. We are, in many communities, the only remaining locally owned and operated television stations. And we were created because people in the communities built those stations. And so our connection to community and the fact that our stations are supported by individuals goes all the way back to our beginnings. And that's what's kept us strong throughout all these years. And so what we've always charged ourselves to do is to be so much more than what the commercial interest just can't achieve. And, it's, and, and again, there's lots of really wonderful television. This is not a judgment against commercial television. It's just they're in a different business than what we're in. So um, it's funny. Um, I have just been reading, and I've, I've gotten to know uh, Newt Minow during my time in public television. And um, he um, was asked, um, he's actually just written a piece on the 50-year anniversary of his speech. but. Um, Ten years ago, on the 40th anniversary of his speech, he was asked to reflect on his comment about you know, the vast wasteland. And he said at the time, a lot of people take issue with me on the ground that the marketplace will provide everything. I say, if that's true, why do we have public libraries? Why do we have public parks? And why do we have public hospitals? We do these things because the marketplace doesn't always have the capacity to provide everything. At PBS, we're a public institution that is dedicated to filling the niche that is not fulfilled by commercial broadcasters. So every day, we work to fulfill Newt's challenge to put the people's airways to the service of the people and the cause of freedom, to per help preserve, help prepare a generation for great decision, decisions, and to help a great nation fulfill its future. We judge our success by the number of lives that we touch not the number of stockholders that we enrich. We are just different than anyone else. And so even in this era of 500 channels, I challenge you, go home and look at what else is on television. And I think you do see a distinctive difference between what we do and, and what others do. And that's what we continue to look for. We look for those places that the commercial marketplace is not filling a need, and we attempt to fill that need. And I'll just close my remarks with a quote from a viewer in Letcher County, Kentucky. We get a lot of, of letters and emails from viewers that use our services. And she wrote to us to say, um, PBS was my lifeline into another world beyond the mountains of eastern Kentucky. And for that, I will always be forever grateful. If every channel we had led with the heart instead of with what sells, just think how much better off everyone would be. Thank you. And I'd be happy to answer any questions you have. I'm concerned by a growing movement in this country that is um, a movement of no. And that's not K-N-O-W, that's N-O, no. Uh, commonly referred to as the politics of no. 
I wonder if you share that concern, and if you do, do you have any formula? Or looking into your crystal ball, what are the ingredients in the future that will help overcome uh, this movement of no? I do share your concern, and I think part of the, um, I think part of the problem is, um, is fed by the media. And I think that we create an um, um, environment where everyone has to win, um, or someone has to win, I should say, not everyone. And, um, and I think that we are, I think the implications of that as a society is that everything becomes much more rigid, everything becomes much more partisan. We can't come together in a way that, and have civil conversations about the issues of the day. So you can't even get to a yes if you can't even have the conversation. So I think that's part of the problem. And being able to create a space for that kind of civility is, is very much a part of what um, we hope to accomplish in the work that we do across. I think the other part is really about empowerment. And this whole idea that um, we can't do things because we don't believe. And um, we have um, just been doing a, um, a series of programs that one of our um, um, uh, journalists, um, Tavis Smiley, had organized. He did a, a, a town hall meeting in, on C-SPAN and then has taken those and broken them up into, into different pieces over a series of nights on his program on public television to talk about the fact that as a country, um, many Americans believe that our best days are behind them. And I think that also enters this whole, this whole uh, culture of no, if I'm understanding your question properly, which is that when you believe that your best days have passed, you tend to hunker down and, and not believe in the possibilities of the future and not believe that uh, we can advance an agenda. I think that as... Um, and I'm not, I'm not stealing from our president's speech, which I believe he's making tonight, if I believe what's been in the journalism, but I believe tonight he'll be calling for a, another Sputnik moment. And I think as a country, we do need to be aspiring towards something that feels so um, big and bold. I know that you had the, the um, head of NASA here talking to you. And when I think about it, as I was growing up, in a classroom here in Baltimore, and I remember those days when they would roll the television sets into the classroom and we would watch the rockets take off, and the idea that a man could stand on the moon seemed like the biggest, most improbable dream. But we did it. We did it as a country, and I'm not suggesting that that be the next frontier, but we have to, I think, have as a, as a nation, some of these big rallying moments of these things that are larger than ourselves that we can aspire to. And I think that begins to move us out of a, a world of, of, of saying no, but really hearkening towards the possible and what it takes to get to yes. So I think that's the other piece of it, if, if I'm answering you. So we do need to become a country of no, but we need to be a country of K-N-O-W. So. Um, my question is, you're hearing more and more about young kids, girls, and boys in the issue of human trafficking. At what point do um, MPT, Maryland Public Television, start to educate young citizens, and what measures do we take? Do you have a duty of care to your young viewers? We have actually done uh, some programs um, at the national level on human trafficking, and actually I was just in... Um, I was just in Dallas in the fall, and of course they're hosting the Super Bowl, and one of the issues that they're um, dealing with at the local level there is that um, one of the um, sort of unknown uh, or untold stories when you have big events like that is that um, um, the amount of prostitution and, and, and trafficking escalates. I was unaware of that, and I think I'm a pretty knowledgeable person about issues. And so they actually were doing some local, they were involved in a big local project there to educate the public about the, um, about the issue. Um, and it's challenging because they're proud that the Super Bowl is, um, is going to be in Dallas, and so it's, it's sort of the seamy side that no one wants to talk about, but it's important. I don't know specifically what Maryland Public Television is doing and I don't know if there's anyone from MPT. I know there's a board member here. I won't pick on you because I know you're new to the board. So I'm not even looking at you. Is there anybody else from MPT here? Because I think that um, 
um, I, I can't um, comment specifically on what they're doing, but I know that a number of our stations are. And as a national story, it is certainly one that we're, we are um, uh, covering and are interested in covering. I would also say that uh, we are starting an initiative uh, that's going to begin um, next year that's a three-year project um, that's specifically focused on women and girls, and it's um, empowering women's, women and girls. And one piece of that actually looks at trafficking as well. Thank you. It's a good question. I am wondering how you respond and if you respond, and I think about this a lot, to a call to eliminate NEA, NEH, and public broadcasting. Yeah, recent, we're all in the same, we're in the same basket together. We are, and, and um, <clears throat> lots of uh, talk in our office about not responding. Uh, you're a wonderful storyteller. Uh, so I just wonder, do you tell your stories? Um, do you not get defensive? What, how do you respond to that? So if you're not responding, there's something wrong with you because I think that um, this is a moment when we need to tell our story of what we do. I think part of the problem that the NEA and the NEH have is that, is that a lot of, of people are unaware of the work that you do and, and the, the many ways that you touch communities. And I think those stories are the most powerful arguments for the continued support of NEA and NEH. There are um, organizations, Americans for the Arts, um, is, you know, puts together a lot of data um, on the national level as well uh, that really looks at, um, for NEA, NEH, and particularly NEA, uh, the impact of the arts on the economy. And, you know, I, um, and, and so there's a, there is a cultural argument for the arts there is an um, economic argument for the arts, which is actually pretty significant because you look at um, the number of, you know, with any arts event, you look at the number of people that not only buy tickets, but then go out to dinner, that, you know, if you have festivals that are buying stuff, um, uh, depending upon the event, that are generating hotel rooms, jobs. I mean, it's, it's um, parking lots. I mean, it's, it's there's... There's a, there, is a, there is a very um, rich economic story behind it. There's a lot of cities, as they're looking at redevelopment, um, uh, studies show that um, having different um, art, arts experiences, symphony, whatever, within a community helps to attract um, potential employees you know, to those cities because it, it helps to contribute to the overall quality of life. And as I've traveled around and have talked to different organizations who are trying to um, um, really revitalize their cities, they're very concerned about what it takes to hold on to their symphonies and their other art, arts organizations. But there's also, um, you know, we've been talking about education. I think that education is, is at the heart of the future of this country. And I think that, you know, every business leader should be very concerned about education because if we don't have a educated workforce, how are we going to find the people to employ for the future? And um, I was listening to the uh, CEO of Dow Chemical that was on NPR this morning talking about some of the um, work that they have outsourced. And you know, the, the, the common belief is that stuff is outsourced just because you, you can get cheap labor. They're outsourcing because they can't find engineers in this country to um, uh, to, to um, employ enough to, for their business. And so they're outsourcing to China right now for that reason, because they can find more engineers. I think we should all be concerned about that. There is an absolute link, so I'm coming back to the arts now, there is an absolute link between the arts and education. And you know there are um, study after study after study that show that you know the kids that become engaged in the arts you know, tend to Perform better in school. There's an absolute link between music and math. You know, uh, most people don't know that Einstein was a lackluster student until he discovered Mozart. And um, you know, so there's lots of there's lots of connections there that we should be talking about as well. So we should be talking about local impact and the lives that we're touching in communities and the import that it has in people that use our services. There is a story that should be told about the, the, the role that we play in terms of as an economic driver for communities and building quality of life. And the third is really the, the tie to education. And I would say that um, the important thing, so you can take this message back to your colleagues, is, is not even that it's you 
as a spokesperson for this message. It really should be the people that are the beneficiaries of the work that you do talking to their legislators. Because at the end of the day, as eloquent as a spokesperson as I would try to be, I am never going to be as powerful a voice as, as a constituent talking to their legislator. And, and legislators do listen. I've been through um, three rounds of attempts, serious attempts, to try to defund public broadcasting in the, in the 18 years that I've been in public broadcasting. And every time that we've been successful in, in beating back a, a challenge to our funding, it's because people have reached out to legislators. They do listen. And that, I think, is the most important thing, because they're there to um, uh, represent the will of the people. And, and I think that's what most people on the Hill try to do. And so if they know that people in their communities care about the future of the NEA, NEH, um, and public broadcasting, then I think they will respond to that. As a leader of a major online content provider, what are your feelings on net neutrality? Thank you for asking me to comment on that. I, I, I mean, I think that um, I think that it is important that all Americans have um, access to broadband. And so I have been very. Um, we have uh, been working and in conversations with the FCC over their overall broadband plan because I think it is important that uh, broadband. Because I, I think again, coming back to jobs creation. I think that it is important for the information that it's providing. I think that it's important in terms of the um, um, way that we're able to reach um, people of all ages. But I also think that it is you know, increasingly the way that you apply for jobs are online. I think that having that kind of connectivity into the home as well as into places like libraries and so forth is, is really important. So I am very much. Um, in favor of uh, ubiquitous broadband. I, I think that um, what we have been wrestling with, because we're very much in the center of some of the discussions, which is the use of spectrum uh, for broadband purposes. And for us, um, we are making robust use of spectrum. Uh, many of our stations are broadcasting multiple channels over the air. And uh, we also have an increasing amount of work online. So. I, I don't want to sound selfish, but we want it both. I want to make sure that every home that has a television is, reach, is getting high quality content. And I want to make sure that every home that has access to a, um, to a computer has it at the kind of, of speed and bit rate that will enable us to distribute video. And, and we do a lot of games as well. Um, that's why our video stream numbers are through the roof and we're the number one video site for kids, because we have videos in the, in, the, um, in the stream so that kids will watch uh, you know, a segment from something, and then they can stop and play. And, and it's not play. for the, it, it's, it is play. But it's also, um, they're not just entertaining themselves. They're also learning and having the opportunity to really engage with kids so that it's not the passive experience of just sitting in front of the TV, but they can actually sit and work through puzzles and at the same time really increase their, their learning is tremendously important. So, um, so I very much um, am a champion for uh, expansion of, of broadband. I would like to know what is it that um, PBS is going to do or can do or is doing presently that will help tie PBS into the church community, not just the church community, but synagogues, temple, and et cetera, because there is a large community that's being, I guess, somewhat ignored and we see thousands of children every week, particularly in the city, not including around the nation. And inclusive of that, we have a program that we meet every Wednesday during Bible study that the children are doing their homework. It's like a study time. Mm -hmm. And is there some type of technology that is presently at hand <clears throat> at um, PBS that can help the children um, grow a hunger for PBS because many of these children are not even introduced to PBS until they are adults. And I'm talking about in the city, typically Latino and blacks. And what are you doing at PBS that will include the church community without yelling um, separate church and state? We actually are very heavily used 
um, by children across the country, but particularly in homes where English is not a first language, and particularly in African American homes. We actually, if you index the number of homes against kids, it's off the charts how many of those kids are watching. And we build most of our programs thinking about those kids. Now, obviously, we're hoping to benefit all children, but we're particularly interested um, in, uh, through television in reaching those kids because we know that um, the content that we're developing can be of help to them. In terms of reaching out to the religious community, there are a few things that we do. One is we do a lot of community outreach. And I, I can't speak for Maryland Public Television. I just know from my own experiences when I was in New York at the station there, we worked with a lot of um, different organizations, uh, particularly as we connected with children. And many churches and organizations have after school programs and so forth. And so we were a partner with a number of those organizations. We have a lot of content available online. And if you go um, into, um, actually, particularly if you go into mpt.org, they have a um, really robust um, uh, amount of, of, of content there for teachers and also for, um, for people who are not professional teachers but that work with children. And I'd encourage you to, to look at that material. You, you ask another question. Your, your question actually raises another issue, which is not really the question you, that you asked, and that is, I think we're the only broadcaster that, on a, on a regular basis, also tries to report on religion. Um, we have a weekly series, Religion and Ethics News Weekly, but we also we just did a series, a four-part series called The Calling, uh, which really looked at people that were inspired to go into faith-based careers, and uh, we profiled um, a series of people. Um, we um, um, have done a series of programs over the years on, on history as part of the history work that we do. Um, and most broadcasters shy away from anything that has anything to do with religion. Religion is an extraordinarily powerful force in society. And so we feel that as part of our mission, as we look at what the, again, coming back to the whole question of market failure and what uh, the commercial media is, is, does or, or, or does not cover, we think that this is a, a, an area that's quite that's quite rich for us. And so um, we're very interested in, in trying to make sure that we're telling lots of different stories and from very different perspectives. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thanks.